Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So far, we already finished chapter 16, and we're going to start chapter 17. So continue talking about another part, uh, metabolic pathway about citric acid cycle. So I will up, I actually updated the online quiz and uh, for exam three. So please check the iCollege for detailed information. When we started glycolysis, when we started glycolysis in chapter 16, we say glycolysis majorly occurred in an aerobic condition, right? And overall, it will generate two ATP. <clears throat> so the location in the cell for glycolysis, majorly it occurred in the cytosol. <clears throat> Sometimes we say cytosolic plasma. That is where the glycolysis occurs. And it starts from glucose <clears throat> to generate pyruvate. So further, <clears throat> excuse me, the pyruvate has has three phases. It can be converted to alcohol or lactate in the aerobic condition without oxygen. We call it fermentation, or it can be converted to Acetyl CoA with the oxygen, uh, with the oxygen in the aerobic condition, right? And as, at the same time, it will release carbon dioxide. <clears throat> that is the phase for the pyruvate. So we know, okay, acetyl CoA can be converted from pyruvate, and that is an important conversion because the acetyl CoA. Look at it here. The acid your CoA will enter the citric acid cycle. Or we say acid your CoA is the one of the initial molecule that will start the citric acid cycle. And of course, there's another molecule, right? But acid your CoA is one of it. All right. So when the acetyl-CoA enter the citric acid cycle, there are another set of reactions, eight steps. And through these eight steps, eventually, it will convert it back to release acetyl-CoA and another initial molecule. So then it starts another cycle. So that's why it's a cycle. There's no final product. Or initial product, so they are endless. It's endless cycle, and very interesting for the citric acid cycle itself. It's not generating that many ATP, that many energy. So overall, it only generates one ATP. Instead, it generates a lot of electron carriers, like NADH and FADH2. So those electron carriers will enter another metabolic pathway, that is oxidative phosphorylation, which we're going to discuss in chapter 18. That pathway will generate a lot of energy, ATP, okay? So that is basically the or relationships between this between the glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, they are actually connected to each other, right? So
<clears throat> so citric acid cycle, there are a bunch of different names. First, you need to know when you are mentioned, okay, citric acid cycle, or sometimes it's called tricarboxylic acid cycle, or just to say, uh, sorry, here actually should be TCA. <clears throat> I don't know why I write TCA. It should be TCA, so tricarboxylic acid, okay, TCA cycle. <clears throat> or sometimes it's called Krebs cycle. They are all the same thing, okay. And this citric acid cycle is a central metabolic hub of the cell. So it actually comes, I mean, it's uh, accept or it's, it's connect the glycolysis and the of oxidative phosphorylation. So always say the citric acid cycle is the gateway to the aerobic metabolism. Okay. So you will see why <clears throat> in a later study. The citric acid cycle, what is it? Right? It basically is a process of <clears throat> excuse me, converting the glucose derivative to carbon dioxide. And uh, the glucose derivative basically means the pyruvate. So the TCA, again, sorry about that. Here should be TCA. The TCA occurred in the aerobic condition. Okay, so different from glycolysis. Glycolysis is in aerobic condition. TCA is in the aerobic condition to generate more energy. And this cycle takes place in the matrix of mitochondria, while glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm or the cytosol, right? If you look at the PowerPoint, so the citric acid cycle takes place here in the matrix of the mitochondria. Okay. <laughs> Most fuel molecules will enter this citric acid cycle as the molecule of acetyl-CoA, which means before these fuel molecules enter the citric acid cycle, the first step, they need to be converted to acetyl-CoA, for example, if you have glucose, carbohydrate, right? So the glucose will be converted to pyruvate, and pyruvate is further converted to acetyl-CoA, and then enter the citric acid cycle. Similarly, fatty acid, which will be converted to glycerol, and then converted to acetyl-CoA, and then enter the citric acid cycle. Same thing for amino acid, right, which comes from protein. The protein will be degraded into the amino acid. Amino acid will be converted to acetyl-CoA and then enter the citric acid cycle. So overall, the citric acid cycle starts from the acetyl-CoA. So now here is the question, what, what is the function of this citric acid cycle in transferring fuel molecules into ATP? Okay, TCA. So overall, the function of this TCA is always seeing high energy electrons from carbon fuels to form NADH and FADH2, which are the electron carriers. So it seems the major function for this 
need to get this cycle is not generating ATP, not generating large amount of energy. Instead, it's just to collect, right? Just to collect more electron carriers. So prepare for generating more energy. So this NADH and FADH2 will enter or will be involved in the oxidative phosphorylation and then generate lots of energy. So the TCA itself actually won't generate a large amount of ATP, only one. And it will not have oxygen as a reactant either. As always, it's aerobic, right? So it involves oxygen, but it's not directly have oxygen as it reacted. So by doing that, it will remove the electrons from acetyl-CoA and use these electrons to reduce NAD plus and FADH to form this NADH and FADH2. which means the acetyl-CoA <clears throat> will be oxidized, right? And this NAD plus and FAD, and FAD will be reduced. Okay, so acetyl-CoA oxidized by losing electrons, and the NAD plus, NAD, FADH, FAD will gain electrons, <clears throat> should be reduced. So the generated NADH <coughs> excuse me, and FADH2 will further generate non-ATP when they are oxidized by oxygen in the oxidative phosphorylation. Chapter 18, we're going to discuss that as a lot compared to one or two in the citric acid cycle and the glycolysis, right? So here you get non-ATP. Okay. That is, we talk about what is citric acid cycle and what is the major function of this citric acid cycle. And also, you need to know where is this citric acid cycle taking place in the cell, right? The location of the cell and the location of the cell for glycolysis. That is for the citric acid cycle. <coughs> okay. So since we say, okay, acetyl-CoA is the starting molecule for this cycle, right? You all the few molecules enter the citric acid cycle through the acetyl-CoA. So how can this your molecules be converted to acetyl-CoA? For example, pyruvate. Actually, this reaction we already say in chapter 16. I remember the last part when we talk about the three phase of pyruvate. We say, okay, pyruvate can be oxidized to be acetyl-CoA in the aerobic condition. So an NAD plus will be reduced. So you have acetyl-CoA, which we call it a two-carbon molecule. Compare this pyruvate with a three carbon. Right? So you're losing this carbon dioxide and you add this acetyl group to the CoA to form this acetyl CoA and carbon dioxide. So the this reaction is an irreversible link between the TCA and the glycolysis. 
which means uh, pyruvate is converted to be acetyl-CoA, it won't be converted back. It's an irreversible reaction, right? And the reaction is catalyzed by this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So this is an enzyme complex. When you say the complex, it means it contains more than one enzyme. So you have more than one enzyme in this pyruvate dehydrogenase. So for this enzyme, you don't need to worry about the detailed mechanisms. However, there are a couple of things you need to know about this enzyme, which are listed in the following. The pyruvate dehydrogenase complex contains three enzymes. It is large for sure, right? So it's a large, highly integrated complex of three enzymes. And it has five coenzymes. Mm. Three enzymes and five coenzymes. So you need to know what are the three enzymes and what are the five coenzymes. Mm. So the first enzyme is a pyruvate dehydrogenase. Oh, it's first one is a dehydrogenase, which is which catalyzes the decarboxylation and the oxidation. Right? Remember in chapter eight when we started enzymes, we said when you have a dehydrogenase, usually it catalyzes oxidation reduction reaction. So here, it, it does catalyze the oxidation and the decarboxylation of pyruvate shown here. Basically, decarboxylation, you remove this carbon, and it's uh, oxidation, <clears throat> right? Once you remove electron. So the dihydrolipoil, Trans, uh, transacylase, that is the second enzyme. This enzyme catalyzes the transfer of acetyl group to the CoA to form the acetyl CoA. Uh, it's a transacetylase. So basically, uh, actually, it's here. Of the acetyl CoA. Oh, sorry, actually, here, yes, this is step two. Step one, step two, both catalyzed by the enzyme one, right? So, enzyme two actually catalyzed the, here I didn't label, here should be step three, catalyzed the step three, which transfer this. Acetyl group to the CoA to form the acetyl CoA. And then enzyme 3, the dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase, another dehydrogenase. It catalyzes the regeneration of the oxidized lipoamide. So here I didn't write, right? So basically, if you further write, it catalyzes the regeneration of the oxidized lipoamide. So overall, the E1 and the E3 components, there are two dehydrogenases, catalyze the two oxidation reduction reactions. And then there are the transacetylase, it catalyzes the transfer for acetyl group from, you know, to the, to the CoA to form this acetyl CoA. So these are the three enzymes, enzymes components in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So you need to know which, I mean, you need to know each enzyme catalyzes what kind of reaction. Okay. You actually can tell from the name, right? So if it's dehydrogenase, it must be oxidation reduction. If it's transacetylase, acetylase, it should be a group transfer, right? 
right, so that is this major enzyme. Well, the five coenzymes, so they are thioamide, pyrophosphate, and the lipoic acid, the FAD, the coenzyme A, and the NAD+. Plus. These are the four, five coenzymes. So you need to know the roles for these five coenzymes. So basically, three of them, the cell amide pyrophosphate, the lipoic acid, and FAD. These three coenzymes, they serve as catalytic cofactors. While the other two, the coenzyme A and the NAD+, they function as co-substrate. So that's different rules for these five coenzymes that you need to know. For example, if I give you a question, ask you, okay, so NAD+, function as a coenzyme in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So which of the following is true? Right? So one of them may say, okay, NAD+, serves as a co-substrate, then it's right. If I say NAD+, serves as a, catalyte, a catalytic cofactor, then it's wrong. Okay? So you have to know which coenzyme serves as co-substrate. <coughs> Which coenzyme serve as a catalytic cofactor? Okay. So that is for the conversion of pyruvate to co uh, to acetyl CoA. So now let's see the big picture of the citric acid cycle. So we see the citric acid cycle always starts from the acetyl CoA, right? So acetyl CoA is one of the initial molecules enter the cycle. And we call it a C2 molecule, which means it has two carbons two carbon molecule. And another initial molecule is oxaloacetate, which has four carbons. So initially the citric acid cycle basically starts from a four carbon molecule and a two carbon molecule. So through two steps of the reaction, basically as a there is a condensation reaction, right? So this car four carbon molecule will combine with this two carbon molecule to form a six carbon molecule. And this six carbon molecule will further have you the reaction to remove carbon dioxide. You can guess there must be uh, oxidation reduction reaction occurred, right? So removed one molecule of carbon dioxide. So the carb six carbon becomes five carbon because you remove one carbon in the for format of carbon dioxide. So the six carbon becomes five carbon. At the same time, so this, this carbon molecule is oxidized. So there must be NAD plus involved. So the NADH is released or removed, released, maybe better, huh? released. Okay. <clears throat> so this step converts a six carbon molecule become a five carbon molecule. And at the same time, release one molecule of NADH. So further, this five carbon molecule is going to continue undergoing an uh, oxidation reduction reaction. So further remove one more 
carbon dioxide. Right. And at the same time, remove another NADH. So this because five carbon remove carbon dioxide, so it become a four carbon molecule. So this four carbon molecule is undergoing a couple of reactions. And through these reactions, it will generate one more of ATP. Sometimes it will say DTP in the liver. Okay, and then at the same time, it will remove another NADH and a FADH2. So if you count, <coughs> excuse me, if you count overall, you have one NADH, one NADH, one NADH. So total, you actually get three NADH released. And one FADH2 <clears throat> released, one ATP is generated, and uh, two carbon dioxide removed. <clears throat> this carbon-4 molecule will be converted back to the oxaloacetate. So here is not oxaloacetate, but another <clears throat> four carbon molecule. Okay, and then this oxaloacetate will by another acetyl-CoA to start a new cycle, okay? So that is the general big picture for the citric acid cycle. During this reaction, during this cycle, you do say they, have, they form different carbon molecules and uh, they release this NADH, FADH2, uh, electron carriers, and they do remove carbon dioxide. So actually overall, there are eight steps, and the final result, the final products you got are listed here, right? Two carbon dioxide, one ATP, three NADH overall, and one FADH2. So this are important energy generation providers for the oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so we will start it later. So now we're going to say exactly what are these reactions? We say, okay, this carbon becomes this, becomes this. So exactly what kind of reactions occurred here? That is what we're going to discuss one step, I mean step by step for the citric acid cycle. Totally eight steps. <clears throat> okay. <coughs> So, the initial, <clears throat> initial molecules enter the citric acid cycle are oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA, the four carbon molecule and the two carbon molecule. So, these <clears throat> two molecules will have a Aldo condensation reaction to form a six carbon molecule, which is a citrate CoA. I mean, the citrate molecule plus a CoA. So, CoA will be released. Okay. So, this reaction actually involved the two steps. <clears throat> The first step is will generate an intermediate product. So you have the condensation, which means you add this CoA to the oxaloacetate, form this called citrial CoA. And then a molecule will cut this 
acetyl CoA and uh, will cut this CoA and the carbonyl bond. Through a hydrolysis reaction, to form this six carbon molecule is called citrate. That actually is one reason why we call it citrate acid cycle, right? The first product you got is a citrate. So the enzyme catalyzes this reaction is the citrate synthesis. the mechanism of the citrate synthesis. It's very similar as the hexokinase actually. So the citrate synthesis, synthesis, I mean the citrate synthesis is undergoing the induced fit. So before it binds to the substrate, it will have a open form structure. <clears throat> and after it binding to the substrate, the enzyme will have a closed structure. Okay. So First, the citrate synthesis, this enzyme, will bind to oxaloacetate. In the open form, it can only bind the oxaloacetate. Here shows the structure. It has an open form, and then if it binds to the oxaloacetate, which is the substrate, then it will form a closed form, right? So it's more closed. So here you see the cleft. And after binding, it's closed. Okay, so that is the induced fit because this structure change is caused by the binding to this oxaloacetate. After having this conformation change, this complex is able to bind the second substrate acetyl CoA. And further, further, it will release CoA and then the citrate. Okay, so be careful for this enzyme. The binding to this to, uh, for this enzyme, the binding to the substrate. It has an order. It can only bind to the oxaloacetate when it has an open form. And after it's bound to this oxaloacetate, it becomes a closed form. Only in the closed form, it will bind to acetyl CoA. Then it will release CoA first, followed by citrate. So that binding mode or the binding model should be a ordered sequential displacement. All right. So it's sequential displacement because it binds to it binds two substrate first and then release two products. Right? So that must be sequential. And because it has an order. And oxaloacetate first, and then acetyl CoA. It has an order, so it's ordered sequential displacement. It make sure you differentiate this from the ping pong. For ping pong, you must bind to one substrate, release a product. Bind another substrate, release another product, right? So for sequential, it binds to all the substrates before releasing any product. So this one is a uh, ordered sequential displacement. So be careful with that. <laughs> so 
So that is the first step for the citric acid cycle. Basically, it's a four carbon molecule oxaloacetate condensed with a two carbon molecule acetyl-CoA and uh, form a six carbon molecule citrate, right? So you need to know the mechanism for the enzyme. In your PowerPoint, they're actually more talking about more about the mechanism. <clears throat> it talks more about your me uh, the mechanism for this citrate synthesis. In the substrate complex here, so the, there is a histidine donate a proton to the carbonyl oxygen of the acetyl-CoA to promote the removal of the methyl proton by the aspartate to form the anion intermediate. So what do you need to know? If I give you this information, right, histidine donates a proton. Let's see, histidine donates a proton to this oxaloacetate, the substrate. Oh, sorry, this histidine. Oh. Histidine here <clears throat> donates the proton. The acetyl CoA to the acetyl CoA. So what the what is the role for the histidine here? It should be an acid, right? So you can donate the proton. And later on, so it's here. Right. So later on, this oxaloacetate is activated by the transfer of a proton from another histidine. So since both these two substrates accept protons from different histidines, right? So the histidine here apparently acted, acted as a role of acid, <clears throat> and the substrate acts the role of a base. And uh, very important is here. By doing that, they form the anion intermediate. And we know anion intermediate is not stable. So, <clears throat> so this anion of the acetyl-CoA will attack the carbonyl carbon of the carbonyl carbon of the oxaloacetate to form this carbon carbon bond. Yeah, the carbon carbon bond, <coughs> which links this oxaloacetate and the acetyl CoA to condense it become a six carbon molecule. Okay, so that is a general mechanism, but again, you don't need to worry about <clears throat> this part. So, you just need to know general information, which one acts as the acid, which one acts as base. Another thing you need to know, there is an anion intermediate formed, which is not stable. And uh, again, for most condensation reactions, it will form an anion intermediate, right? And then further, it forms a bond to connect the two molecules. Okay? So that is the first step of citric acid cycle. Second step. As, uh, the citrate formed in step one actually is not that 
that stable. If you look at the structure for the citrate, right? So you have, I mean here, carbon three. In carbon three, you have a hydroxyl group. At the same time, in carbon three, you have a carboxylic group. So when you have a hydroxyl group and a carboxylic group in the same carbon, so it's not stable. Then the citrate try to convert to a more stable form. Then it requires isomerization reaction. Right? So the isomerization reaction converts citrate to be isocitrate. So the enzyme catalyzed this isomerization is a cognitive. Actually, this reaction also includes two reactions. The first reaction is a dehydration, and the second reaction is a hydrolysis. So through the dehydration reaction, you remove one more of one molecule of water from this intermediate product, which is this aconitate with a carbon carbon double bond. And we know that it's not stable, so further it will have a intramolecular transfer, group transfer, right? So this, <clears throat> hydro, this hydroxyl group will, will transfer from carbon-3 to carbon-2, and this hydrogen from carbon-2 will be transferred to carbon-3. So the and so eventually it from the isocitrate that is your product. So here we already explained so why this reaction is required to get a more stable molecule. Again, there are two steps: dehydration and uh, I should say hydrolysis, <clears throat> hydrolysis. So overall, you remove a water, you add a water. So overall, there's no water, right? So important thing for this enzyme, actually we will see this enzyme again in chapter 18, because it's special structure, special component. So the enzyme catalyzes the isomerization a cognitive, so which is an iron sulfur protein. So it contains iron and sulfur. So when we say iron, you probably think about the heme group. Remember in chapter seven, when we started the hemoglobin, myoglobin, we started heme group. A heme group is always involves an iron atom, right? So, and uh, this iron, that iron will connect to uh, to nitrogen from histidine. And from other organic groups from the heme group. And here, the iron atom in the aconitus is not connected with, is not bound with nitrogen. Instead, it's bound with sulfur. So this is an iron sulfur protein. It's not a heme group, okay? Differentiate that. Although they both have iron, but in aconitus, it's an iron sulfur protein. So it's not heme group. So this iron, Instead of nitrogen, this iron atom, actually there are four iron atoms in the aconitus. They are complex to four inorganic sulfide. We will look at the structure later. Four inorganic sulfide and the three, and the three sulfur from three cysteine residues. That means totally it has seven Sulfur bound to these four iron atoms, right? Four inorganic sulfide and three sulfur from 60 residues. 
and there's one iron atom available for the binding to citrate. And uh, when the iron binds to citrate, it binds to this group, the carboxylic group and the hydroxyl group. Let's say the structure of the aconitase. Here we go. So this aconitase has four iron, four sulfur iron, I mean four iron, four sulfur cluster. Like shown here, this iron binds to the sulfur here, and another sulfur here, and another one here. So there are uh, also sulfurs from the citrate here, and three, totally three, I mean, totally three cysteine, and uh, four, one, two, three. So there's one not showing here, right? So, but it should be there. So, one, two, three, four, right? So, four sulfide, four sulfide, and the three from 60. One, two, three. Right, so three from sixty, four sulfide. They bound to this four iron atoms, and they there is still space left for the binding to citrate and to the citrate through the hydroxyl group and the carboxylic group. Okay, so that is the binding. How does the iron binding with the citrate? So what do you need to know for the for this aconitase enzyme? You need to know there's the iron there actually not just one iron, right? There is the iron clusters. And in this iron clusters, there are four iron atoms. So how are the iron atoms binding to the sulfur? And uh, the sulfur comes from what molecules? Three from 60, four are inorganic sulfide. And also you need to know the iron, when the iron binds to the citrate, it binds to which group? The carboxylic group and hydroxyl group. Okay, so that are the information we want to discuss today. So the rest reactions, the rest steps for the citric acid cycle, we're going to discuss in next lecture. Okay, so you can go back and review all this all the notes and uh, working with practice problems. So we will do more practice problems next lecture too. So today we're going to stop here and we will continue next time. Okay. 